A British lord who killed his children's nanny is reported to be living in a Buddhist commune in outer Brisbane. A facial recognition expert enlisted by the nanny's son says the pensioner is a startling match for the fugitive. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And that was Nine News Queensland closing in on a 48-year-old murder mystery featuring a runaway British aristocrat, a lead pipe and a dead nanny. And who is the missing fugitive? Lord Lucky Lucan, who disappeared in London in 1974 and was being reprised last week by a new generation of journalists. A lord on the lam for almost 50 years. It's a modern day mystery. Where is Lord Lucan, also known as Richard John Birmingham? Well, not quite. Make that Bingham. And why were the TV networks so excited? Because the missing British toff was supposedly lurking in our backyard. And on Seven, this discovery was being hailed as a breakthrough. It was a brutal murder. Lord Lucan's nanny, Sandra Rivette, bashed to death. His wife, Veronica, also assaulted, while he mysteriously vanished. But now bombshell new evidence suggests Lord Lucan is alive and living in Brisbane. So where does this bombshell new evidence come from? The UK tabloids, of course. In this case, the Daily Mirror. World exclusive. Pick of Aussie old age pensioner, exact match for Lucan. Missing since 1974. Living in Australia. And sure enough, the facial recognition expert behind the matchup was soon spruiking his story with Carl on Today. How certain are you that it's him? Um, as certain as my algorithm can be. The algorithm has been tested uh, thousands and thousands of times and it's been trained using millions and millions of photos. Um, so it is a very reliable algorithm. A reliable algorithm that can't be wrong. That's despite Lord Lucan being declared officially dead by a UK court, as Seven News reported at the time. A mix of murder, money, nobility and at times what have seemed like quite bizarre conspiracy theories. In law at least we now know that Lord Lucan is dead. Legally dead, maybe. But the son of the murdered nanny believes Lord Lucan is anything but. And Neil Berryman has been in hot pursuit for more than a decade. With the media more than happy to make it, front page news. Victim's son. I've tracked down Lord Lucan. Suspected killer Lord Lucan hiding out in Perth suburb. That was in 2020, with Berryman claiming the Lucan lookalike was living in Perth as a Buddhist in a share house. He says he passed on the information to authorities who ultimately dismissed it. Now, nearly three years on, Berryman says the elusive British villain, who would now be 87, is living at a monastery on Brisbane's outskirts. But when Nine News went to investigate, they came up empty handed. The monk at this commune has told Nine News there is no one living here who matches the age or the description of Lord Lucan. We were even shown around the grounds and the cabins. There's no sign of the 87-year-old. So for now, the mystery goes on. As it has for decades, with hundreds of reported sightings over the years, from Africa to Asia, Nepal to the Bahamas. As the late Daily Mirror journalist Garth Gibbs once joked, his most spectacular success in journalism was not finding Lord Lucan. I have successfully not found him in more exotic spots than anybody else. I spent three glorious weeks not finding him in Cape Town, magical days and nights not finding him in the Black Mountains of Wales, and wonderful and successful short breaks not finding him in Macau either. But what about this latest sighting in Brisbane? After all, the facial recognition expert told The Mirror... There's no doubt in my mind that it's the same person. Well, the Daily Mail had its own bombshell exclusive last week. And guess what it found? He's not Lord Lucan. Home Office approved facial recognition experts conclude British Buddhist 87 living in Australia is not missing aristocrat. With the paper thundering, it had seen the Home Office approved analysis of the two men side by side, which, quote, definitively rules him out as Lucan. So, end of pursuit? No, not likely. We're told Neil Berriman is not giving up and that he now plans to... Bypass UK police and bring in Mystery Man. We can't wait for that. And with the 50th anniversary of Lucan's disappearance approaching, you can guarantee he'll be making more cameos in your newsfeed. Maybe in a town near you. But now, to fools and their money. Wow, wow, wow. Look at this sea of red. The carnage continues. $15,000 Bitcoin. 
Even if you haven't bet your life on Bitcoin, you probably know that last week was a disaster for cryptocurrencies. On Wednesday, the world's third biggest crypto exchange, FTX, collapsed, wiping out the entire 16 billion US dollar fortune of its founder, Sam Bankman-Fried, who is now said to be helping Bahamas police with their inquiries. Only two weeks ago, the so-called king of crypto was being hailed by the Australian Financial Review as the world's youngest rich person who was going to solve crypto's image problem. And weeks before that, he was being lauded on the cover of America's Fortune magazine as the next Warren Buffett, the investment guru who can do no wrong. Seems that Bernie Madoff or Enron might have been a better comparison because SBF's crypto empire has left thousands of creditors owed billions of dollars. And people are now asking if more will follow. How many other stories are there like that out there? And how many more can we sustain given, uh, as Mike referenced, the already enormous losses of this year, which, by the way, are way bigger than the losses sustained during the dot-com yeah. crash? In just two days last week, the best-known digital currency, Bitcoin, lost more than a fifth of its value, plunging to 16,000 US dollars to be nearly 80% below its peak last December. And most other leading cryptocurrencies fared worse. So, was this a surprise? To the ABC's Ian Verinder, it was not. Describing crypto investing as risk-taking on steroids, he told the ABC's Richard Glover, it became, I guess, simply just one of those things that everybody jumped upon. And as they did, the value went up. And because the value was going up, more people got involved. Remember that the tulip bubble back in, I think it was 1652 or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I don't personally uh, remember it. But... And everybody in, in, in Holland decided the tulips were worth, you know, more than a house, a tulip bulb. And, uh, you know, what happened to that? It all came unstuck. And I'm pretty sure this is going to go pretty much the same way as well. So, is anyone in the media still pushing cryptocurrencies as a good investment? Answer, yes. On Wednesday, just before the crash, US money magazine Forbes was telling readers which of the 20,000 odd digital currencies was best to buy and picking Bitcoin as number one. Bitcoin's price has skyrocketed as it's become a household name. In May 2016, you could buy one Bitcoin for about $500. As of November 8, 2022, a single Bitcoin's price was around $20,301. That's a growth of 3,960%. Forbes was also telling readers how to get into the game and making it easy for buyers by linking to four partner trading sites and declaring it would be taking a commission if readers clicked through. The Times in London and America's Time magazine have been doing the same, taking a cut from readers of their crypto guides. And even after last week's crash, Time's next advisor was still ramping it up, offering expert Bitcoin price predictions and telling prospective buyers... Bitcoin had a rocky first half of the year, but experts still say it will eventually hit $100,000 and that it's more a matter of when, not if. Adding... It's only reasonable for Bitcoin investors to be curious about how high it can ultimately go. It's also reasonable to ask how low because plenty of experts, including those at the US NASDAQ, say prices could go to zero. And the boffins at the Bank of England agree. Simple game theory tells us that investors really should be prepared to lose everything eventually. Surely the media should highlight those warnings when showing investors how to buy in. But often they do not. News.com.au, The Herald Sun and Yahoo Finance have all infused about the fortune to be made. Several celebrities have also sullied their reputations by urging others to trade. America's biggest NFL star, seven-time Super Bowl winner Tom Brady, sank millions into the now-collapsed FTX and acted as its brand ambassador with ads like this one in July. A lot of people think this is how you mine Bitcoin, but you don't need a flamethrower to buy, sell or trade Bitcoin and crypto safely. You just need FTX. And Aussie sports stars have also spruiked risky investments that later went bust. Former Australian cricket captain Michael Clarke backed an Aussie crypto startup called Global Tech, which folded before it even issued its coins. While fellow cricketer Adam Gilchrist, Olympian Nova Peris, and AFL star Gary Ablett Jr. put their names to Sportimon Go, a producer of non fungible tokens. Hey guys, I'm pumped to let you know that I've partnered with Australia's leading NFT company, Sportimon Go. Sportimon Go collapsed last May. 
But it's not just sports people looking stupid, as the industry has its Lehman Brothers moment. The Motley Fool is a US and Australian investment website which writes stories that turn up on your Google and Facebook feeds. And when the crypto boom was at its peak last December, the fool was asking... Should you buy Bitcoin while it's still below $70,000? And responding with an emphatic yes. While there's no guarantee that Bitcoin will continue rising, there are some good reasons investors should consider snatching up the cryptocurrency right now. Oh dear. And with Bitcoin now worth 80% less, has the lesson been learned? Well, no. Here's the fool again. Last week, only hours before the latest meltdown, tipping Bitcoin to go, quote, even higher. Younger investors are increasingly interested in cryptocurrency exposure, and that means great things for Bitcoin. Obviously not called the fool for nothing. But there were plenty of other cheerleaders in the media and financial community keeping them company. And as the smoke cleared from the crypto crash on Wednesday, Forbes was asking, wait for it, is it the right time to buy the dip? and once again giving tips on how to do it. But now to those crucial US midterm elections, which will set the shape of American politics for the next two years, and which had two hotshot Australian commentators along for the ride. James, you know what I want? What do you want? I want to be a cowboy. You want to be a cowboy? Yes, two Sky News outsiders, Rita Panahi and James Morrow, rode into town to talk to real American voters. Starting down there in Texas, I am 100% for Republicans because they still believe in America. And moving on to Florida. Now, Joe Biden is in Florida today. Any words of advice? Please get out of here. <laughs> What's he doing wrong? Uh, he should be impeached for crimes against this country. You get the picture. To be fair, we did get some dissenting voices in the mix, but they came with a disclaimer. Let's start with woke college kids of Florida State University in Tallahassee who dutifully regurgitated Democrat talking points. And this academic was right on message with the Democrats' latest scare campaign. And having conducted this unbiased in-depth polling, Rita Panahi was able to declare a Republican red wave was on the way. We're only two days away from the election. All indicators point to a red wave. But will it be a ripple or a tsunami? And the answer? It was certainly no tsunami. The red wave seems to be more like a red ripple. This was not only not a red wave, it was not a red tide, it was barely a red trickle. Perhaps, too early to tell, perhaps a pink trickle. This is a red ripple, a red murmur. We don't exactly know what the right adjective uh, to describe it is yet. It's now clear the Republicans have failed to take the Senate, where the Democrats are still in charge, but they may well take the House. But amid their disappointment, Fox News did note one big winner. The red wave has not materialised in the House yet, but you know where it did materialise? the great state of Florida. The cover of the New York Post says young GOP star DeSantis romps to victory in Florida. DeSantis is the future. Ron DeSantis smashed his Democratic opponent by 20 points, cementing his position as Donald Trump's heir apparent. And if he was the future, the Murdoch's New York Post made it even clearer who was in the past. Trumpy Dumpty. Don. Who couldn't build a wall. Had a great fall. Can all the GOP's men put the party back together again? Inside, the paper declared, toxic Trump is GOP ballot poison. With the post-conservative columnist, John Pod Horitz, calling him... Perhaps the most profound vote repellent in modern American history. The Murdoch's New York tabloid backed Trump all the way to the White House in 2020. But he got stuck into him when he lost the last election and refused to concede. And that about turn reportedly came from the top, as New York Times reporter Maggie Haberman writes in her new book on Trump. We should throw this guy over. Rupert Murdoch said of Trump, exhausted by Trump's refusal to concede and his almost manic speech on election night. In the two years since then, Ron DeSantis, a hardline opponent of COVID mandates, illegal immigration and LGBT rights, has emerged as a popular campaigner. And last week, the Murdoch media machine began priming its audience for a presidential bid in 2024. I think Governor DeSantis is the biggest single winner of the night, and he will almost certainly become uh, the rallying point for everybody in the Republican Party uh, who wants to uh, move beyond President Trump. 
The Murdoch's Wall Street Journal also dumped on Trump last week with an editorial declaring him done. And is this chorus of opinion from the Murdoch mastheads just a coincidence? Almost certainly not, as CNN reported. It suggests that Murdoch might use his influence to tilt the scales and push Republicans toward DeSantis if the two squared off in a 2024 Republican primary. So, how is Trump taking the news of losing his Murdoch backers? About as well as you might expect. A rambling statement on Friday took aim at his political opponent and the Murdochs. News Corp, which is Fox, The Wall Street Journal and the no longer great New York Post, is all in for Governor Ron DeSanctimonious, an average Republican governor with great public relations. They will keep coming after us, MAGA, but ultimately we will win. Well, maybe. But without help from the Murdoch media, and Fox News in particular, a Trump repeat seems much less likely. And that's all from us for tonight. We'll be back next week at the earlier time of 8.30, right after Australian Story. Don't forget our latest episode of Media Bytes on Facebook, YouTube and iView. But for now until next week, goodbye. Mm -hmm.